Let the beauty and delightfulness and favor of the Lord our God be upon us. I like that. The beauty, delightfulness, and favor of the Lord be upon us. Confirm and establish the work of our hands. Yes, the work of our hands. Confirm and establish it. Father, we thank you. And we need you. We can do nothing without you. Though we may live on this earth and work, be successful. Without you, it's just vanity. It's, it, it becomes a place where rust and moths eat away. But God, we want your blessing, your favor. The blessings with no sorrow attached to it. I ask Holy Spirit as we touch lives, touch people, move in their hearts, change them. Change them to be more and more like you. That we would step out of ourselves and touch the hurting, touch the lost, those that are, don't know or unaware of who and how great you are. I ask it in Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen and Amen. So we know in these last several messages that God wants to bless us materially, emotionally, and spiritually. Abraham believed God. Jacob endured trials. David fellowship with the Holy Spirit. All these are, are things that we have to do incorporate in our lives. Believe God. Endure trials and fellowship with the Holy Spirit. As we maximize the overflow life, and that's what I call it, we live in the overflow. Prayer, our prayer should be with pure motives if we're going to be in the overflow. We should seek God's kingdom. Seek you first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and everything else will be added to you. And everything we do, we should bring God glory. Because although we have to have capacity, we have to have skills to do what we do. But without the Lord... There's nothing. Uh, you know, don't think that anybody with skill is just because they practice real hard. They may have practiced real hard, but there was God-given abilities that they honed. God-given. So we have to give God glory and then pursue intimacy with the Holy Spirit to really get to know Him. Not just know about it, because most Christians know about Jesus. Most Christians know about the Holy Spirit, but most Christians don't know Him. I mean intimacy, where you're able to te step into the deep. See, those that go into the deep, they see the miraculous works of the Lord. So unfortunately, I, I think we, we've come to an era where we have bench warmer Christianity. Now, if you're not into sports, you may not know what I mean. But you have the starting of basketball, for I love basketball. Played it all my life. I had a basketball joint. You never wanted to, to come off the bench. You wanted to start. I was a point guard. I didn't want to be a bench warmer. So we fought to be a starter. Well, most Christians nowadays, they don't mind just sitting on the bench and watching. Watching the game. Right? We shouldn't be watching the game. We should be in the game. But we've come to an era where people think it's okay just to watch the game. So you must be ready. If you're, not, if you're going to get into the game, then you have to be ready to go into new territory. Now, it's very important, because I'm, I'm just trying to review what we're talking about, what we've been talking about. If you're going to go into new territory, this means one thing very important. You have to be new. In other words, you can't do what you've always done to go into new territory. Because what you've always done is only good enough for where you're at. But if, and people say, I want new territory. Okay, that's great. Then everything you've done so far, you have to put it away. To go into new territory, you have to do something new. Hmm? It doesn't take the same work. It's different work. So then anybody ready to move into new territory? Amen. See, we read, we've been going through Joshua, the book of Joshua. In fact, we finished the book of Joshua last week. 
But we know that God told Joshua, everywhere where you step your foot, I'm going to give this to you. Right? Uh, I'm, I'm going to, uh, just like I promised Moses, I promise you, wherever you step, that's what I'm going to give to you. And in Joshua 1 5, he says, There's no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Then he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Why did he say that? Because when you step into new territory, it's a little frightening. Because you're not used to it. It's, it's different territory. You've never been there. You don't know where the trail leads. There's a turn there. So there's always a little apprehension. So God comforted Joshua just like God has to comfort us. When we step into new things, he goes, don't worry about it. It may be frightening, but I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Just keep stepping. Because wherever you step, I'm going to give it to you. So Joshua had to advance and take possession. And we see that God uh, gave, him a continue, uh, gave him an assurance of his continual presence. And like Joshua and others after him, we have territory given in the material, emotional, and spiritual realm. You, look at your neighbor, you have territory. Huh? And God's there, it's there. The only problem here is this, you have to go get it. If you, if, if you leave here today and just go back to your normal life and go watch TV, you know, uh, do your nails, uh, comb your hair, dye your hair, go back to the same market, do everything the same, my friend, you're not in new territory. You're just doing the same thing, right? No, you have to go out there. Our territory is called our, our sphere of influence. And we have many spheres of influence that, over, that, uh, as we, that we have living in the overflow there's unlimited opportunities, family, church, business, community. But wherever it is, it's like, who wants a raise at their job? Raise your hand. Okay, if I'm your employer and say, you want a raise? Okay, why? Why? So you could do the same thing? I, don't, I already pay you for what you're doing. So why should I give you a raise? You have to, when you come for a raise, you go, but I can, not only I can do this, I can do this. Oh, now you're stepping into new territory. So now it's not enough to pay you for what you've been doing because you're not just doing what you're doing. What you've been doing, you're doing something new. Oh, now I'm going to give you a raise. So a lot of people think they can get a raise for doing what they're doing. You don't get a raise for doing what you, you're already getting paid for. You need to do something new. Hello. So it's a principle. So God blessed Joshua. He said, I'm going to give you a sphere of influence in your church, in your family, your business. I'm going to give you that sphere of influence. Now, what are you going to do with it? See, we want new territory. Okay, go for it. Do something new in those spheres, those influence areas that you have. And everybody has one. God blessed Joshua for his purposes to go step out. And his desire is to bless you for his purposes as well. But don't expect a blessing from God if, you just, if you're doing what you're doing now, tomorrow. Because you already got his blessing. You're doing it. Right? You got a new job? Okay, there's his blessing. Do it. You want another, a better paying job? Then you got to do something different. I don't know what it is, but the Holy Spirit will tell you. He'll instruct you. He'll move you to opportunity. You know, people say, how do, how do you uh, build a ministry? And, and you know, it's like, I don't know. I can't give you a, a, a pattern, but I do know this. Windows of opportunities come your way. They come your way. The difference between somebody who can build something and somebody, something who, someone who can't build, listen to this, is a person who builds knows when to pull the trigger. That's it. Some people don't pull the trigger. Oh, I'm afraid the cuckoo might cost money. I don't know if I can do that. And they, they don't pull the trigger, so the opportunity goes by them. But everybody is given a window of opportunity. It's not that the opportunity don't come. Do you know when to pull the trigger? So that only comes with a real intimate relationship with God because he begins to show you and confirm, pull the trigger, do it, take the step, move. Hmm? It's like when I always show up at the campus, the opportunity came my way. You want this campus? I got no money. I can't do it. It needs uh, tens of thousands or almost 100,000 to fix. Can I do it? Got the opportunity for me to get to campus made no sense. Nope, can't do it. Boom, but I pulled the trigger. Why? Because I've learned to listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Same thing happened with the prophet uh, on 430 Redwood. I knew when to pull the trigger. Opportunities. 
Do you know when to pull the trigger? Huh? That's when you begin to advance in different areas. So there's a, there's a five flows. When we talk about an influence, real briefly, we talked about Isaiah 45, 2 and 3, our scriptures, the promise that God gave us. And on Isaiah 54, rather, it says, Enlarge a place of your tent, stretch your tent, tent curtain wide, do not hold back, lengthen your cords, strengthen your stinks. I talked to the men on Saturday, I talked about what are you guys doing? See, Isaiah 45, 2, the first promise, we don't have to do anything. All we have to do is have, have a place, and God said, I will give you treasures out of darkness. So that means I don't have to do anything but provide a place for the treasures to come. That's it. And, and in fact, that's what happened. Boom. But on, on the second promise, we have to get busy. See, the second promise is something that we have to do. Enlarge, stretch, release, lengthen, strengthen. See, he said, now you're going to have to do this. I did the first promise, and I'll bring you treasure of darkness. But what are you going to do now? Now you have to stretch. The sister scripture, I call it, is in 2 Corinthians 9, 10 through 11. Let's all turn to 2 Corinthians 9, 10 through 11. And it reads, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed. And when larger harvest of your righteousness, you will, make, uh, you will be made rich in every way so you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Now, doesn't that sound good? Especially when it ends, he goes, you shall be made rich in, very, in every way. And we all like that. But you got to understand, there's a process. God gives us his process towards blessing. He says, as you give seed to the sower. Now, if we personalize it, because we're all in Victory Outreach, the sower to you is Victory Outreach Ministries. As you give seed to the sower... God will increase your store of seed. Very simple. God will bring us closer to him, and God will enlarge your harvest. There's a process, there's a principle. That is part of our work of stretching and enlarging our tent. I like the way the New Living Translation reads when you read Isaiah 54, 2 and 3. It reads like this. Enlarge your house. Build an addition. Spread out your home, for you will soon be bursting at the seams. Your descendants will take over other nations and live in their cities. Hmm? That's a promise. Your descendants, our descendants, will go and do these things. So an, increase, where the, an increase of your influence will begin right where you're at. It's not like, you know, I heard some people, you know, I'm, I'm serving God and, and I'm working hard on, on earth because God's going to bless me one day in heaven. Now, that's cool. But listen, I'm here to tell you, you ain't got to wait till you die and go to heaven to be blessed. God wants to bless you right where you're at, right now. Huh? But you have to understand the, the, the basic principles. But what happens, we, we, put, we put dams. You know what a dam is, right? Or the blocks of water. We dam up the overflow of God. See, the, the greatest thief of your overflow is how you think, how you act. Because some people are introverted. Now, I know, you know, some people, you know, oh, I'm shy. <laughs> okay. Introversion. Introversion is either age-induced, because you're very young, or it's been emotionally programmed into you. Introversion. See, being young never excuses you from God's use, but the young tend to be more introverted. They're, they're you know, oh, and I'm not sure because they're young. But when you have an old person, hello, somebody, and they've been around a while, and also they want to act like they're introverted, they're shy, what the heck happened to you? See, somebody messed you up because you're not called to be that way. You're called to be the head and not the tail. You're called to be more than a conqueror, but if somebody got to your mind. And put that into, oh, no, 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 my friend, that's a loser mentality. You know, you ever meet people with loser mentality? You can, it could be the best day, the sunniest day, the most beautiful day, and they see what a storm's coming. They, they turn the, the, big, the most positive thing into a negative. And that spirit seems to draw bad luck. They got that old blues song, you know. If I didn't have any bad luck, I wouldn't have any luck at all. Huh? Jeremiah had this problem when he was young coming into his ministry, or should I say prior to learning how to expand his influence. So the deal is, 
if you want to get out of it, you have to learn to expand your influence. And even the most introverted person in their lifetime will affect 14,000 people. The most introverted. You're gonna, in other words, your introversion, you, who you are, you're gonna affect somebody. If you're a woman, guess what? You will have kids and you'll put every hang up that ever came to you, you will put them on those children. And then you talk about that curse and all oh, the devil cursed me. The devil didn't curse you. Family did. Their way of thinking, the way, the way of pressuring you. And you have to break out of that. God says you're more than that. You're a royal priesthood. Huh? You're a holy nation. He has called you to greatness. And you have to break out of that. Because so I know I met, met many people who were their parents that you're stupid. You ever, you know, and if that's your parent, we're going to break you out of that. Because it's not your parents' fault. Somebody taught them that. And, that, and ultimately that's the devil. Because you were made perfect. You're right. God made you just the way you're supposed to be. Huh? The enemy comes in and tries to destroy you. Jeremiah, here he is, a young man, and he's the prophet Jeremiah. He tells God in Jeremiah 1.6, Oh, sovereign Lord, I don't know how to speak. I'm only a child. But the Lord said, do not say, I'm only a child. You must go to everyone I send you and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you. See, being shy is tolerated by the young but the young must mature or risk becoming an introverted adult, missing huh, their new territory, missing the promises that God has for you. Huh? Paul had Timothy, and Timothy was a very introverted ma young man. But Timothy saw something in Paul when he was stoned to death and he was left for dead on the Damascus road. He saw Paul rise up uh, after being stoned to uh, near death. And he said, no, well, now most of us, if we got stoned like that and rose up, we'd split. Not the apostle Paul. After these people tried to kill him, he got up. He shook the stones off, the blood coming from his body, the bruises all over him. And he went back into the city and spoke to the very people who tried to kill him. And he shared the gospel. Timothy saw that. This introverted young boy said, man, what manner of man is that? So later on, as, as Paul sent Timothy out, he goes, Timothy, you did not receive the spirit of timidity. You did not re receive a spirit of fear, but you were given a spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind, of sound discipline. So speak the gospel with boldness. Do what you're called to do. Stir the gift in you. So sometimes you got to stir it up. Hello, somebody. Sometimes you got to stir it up. You got to talk to yourself. Say, self, stop sniveling. Self, stop being like this. Got to stir it up. Got to stir it up. Because it's in you, that spirit of God. See, people say, well, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, what Holy Ghost? Some of you ain't filled with the Holy Ghost. You're filled with Casper. Casper the friendly ghost, I guess, right? Because there ain't no, the Holy Ghost is power. The Holy Ghost is, is strength. The Holy Ghost is, is ready to move. Some of you go, oh, I don't know. What would they think? Right? We're in due to power. Now, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So you got to keep hearing the Word of God. If you're a little shy, keep putting that Word of God. Eventually, with enough word, that introversion that kills the potential in you will be removed. But you got to keep hearing the word of God. Don't reject the leading of the Holy Spirit. See, that's the only thing that can hinder you if you reject the leading of the Holy Spirit. Allowing fear to rule rather than God. Huh? That's why Hebrew, the Hebrew writer said, Look, I can say with confidence that the Lord is my shepherd. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? You, you've heard me say many times. You know, people will threaten you, you know, tell you to shut up or threaten you with death. I go, you can't threaten me with heaven. Now, the worst you can do if I for preaching God is somebody kill me. Well, oh, I'm going to heaven. So you can't threaten me with heaven. And they ask, well, aren't you afraid when you go to Africa? We must have bad ghettos in Africa. No. Nope. Aren't you afraid when you go to Indonesia, the largest Muslim country in the world, that they might kill you? No. Nope. Why? Because they can't threaten me with heaven. I'm going to preach the gospel wherever I got to go. Why? Because God has promised me new territory. And I believe that. And the reason I believe that, that's how I ended up convincing Nikki to go to Indonesia. Because so God said, if I step there, we can do it. 
I went to Indonesia and I came back and Nikki, you want to go do a crusade? We convinced him. Why? Not because of me, because I know God promised me. And the promise is coming to pass right before your eyes. Everywhere I step, I'm going to give it to you. Everywhere you step. So I expect miracles. I expect something to happen. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. So keep me in prayers. Hmm? So you, and some people think they're ungifted. Untru- you know, not, not to lie to. Listen, I don't care who you are or how much you look down. Because some people look down on themselves. Listen, you are gifted. The problem is the enemy, the world, have taught you to hide your gift. Or, or, or put things in you that don't, don't allow you to step out. To the ungifted mind to believe that a person called by God, saved and appointed by the spirit of creation, and anointed by the Lord has no gift. That is an unfounded and complete lie. You have gifts. Huh? You're called. Paul was talking to the Corinthian church, and he goes, consider your calling, brethren. Not many of you were called, were wise according to the flesh. Not many of you were mighty and noble. But I like this for you who think you're ungifted. But God, say, but God. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame things that which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised. God has chosen the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are. So that no man may boast. So if you think, well, I ain't got no gift, you're the perfect person for God. Because he wants to use those. Who would have thought somebody from the ghettos of Northern California huh, could travel the world and lead people to the Lord? Nobody but God. Who would have thought that God can reach down in Colorado and snatch some of you out of the po-po to do something great for God? Nobody but God. Who would have thought? Oh, man, God chooses the foolish things of the world. Huh? See, see, see you got to step forward. Don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to fail. I always think about Abraham Lincoln who lost eight elections before he won. And he became president. He kept losing and losing and losing and losing. He just never gave up. I think he just kept trying so much. They go, okay, elect him now. But he just kept going, kept going, kept going. And look at how God used that man who was not afraid to fail. Don't be afraid of failure. Failure is, is part and parcel of success. Hmm? You think the first time Thomas Edison lit his light bulb, it worked? No, thousands of attempts were done before he finally got one to work. He, he wasn't afraid to fail. You got to keep trying. Huh? You got to keep going. You got to never give up. Huh? Just keep trying. Keep trying. So others are... So they're elected to surrender control. And that's the hard one, especially when you're walking with God. Because there comes a time if, okay, you want me to be in control? God, talking about the Holy Spirit? He goes, then you need to surrender control. What does that mean? That means you don't know where you're headed. See, I tell people all the time, I'm not really sure where I'm headed, but I know I'm on the right track. And that's what matters most. Get on the right track. You may not know where you're headed, but get on the right track. Because if you're on the right track, wherever you're headed is going to be good. Why? Because you've surrendered control to God. I know some people, they won't even step out the door or go on any kind of trip or anything unless they have a perfect itinerary. I mean, it's got to be perfect. At 9 a.m., we're having breakfast. Uh, 10 o'clock, after breakfast, we're going to the bathroom. At 10.30, we're going to, I mean, they have everything down to a second. They, they, they can't operate with a perfect, without a perfect itinerary because they want everything to be controlled. They're so, they're so you know, OC. Everything's got to be right. No faith. No faith. No faith. God doesn't work that way. He tells you, Go. And I'll see, I'll tell you what I want you to do. He didn't tell you, go and plan it all. He goes, go and I'll tell you what I want you to do. And then he won't tell you until you start going. We, we don't we want, we want a plan. No, 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 no. You have to surrender control. See, others worry if they give control, he will send them to the worst place on the planet. I mean, we, we, years ago, we were barely setting churches out. 
And Pastor Steve sent the church to the Philippines. And then he said, he actually sent teams to Spain to start the church in Spain. He said, Pastor Christian, we, we sent the first people to Ireland. I thought of Hayward. That's why it's in me. We always send people out to do something. And we had a joke. It was me, Bob, Dennis Waller. Dennis Waller went to the of the Lord. And we did a song. Please don't send me to Africa, right? Because no, we, we didn't want to, I didn't want to go to Africa. And in my mind from the neighborhood, I go, Africa? I don't want to go to Africa with some Swahili swords. And I, 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 had, I thought Africa was some primitive tribal place where they, they eat, you know, ostrich. I did, we had no concept. But we were like afraid. I don't want to go to Africa. You, you go to Africa. I ain't going to Africa. And guess what? We ended up going to Africa. Never tell God where he wants to send you. But see, we think God will send you to the worst place. Listen, even if it is the worst place, it's the best place for you. If God created you for that, it's the best place for you. God's not going to give you something that's going to harm you. He's going to give you something that's going to bless you. But you have to surrender. Others so God might take away everything they, tre- they cherish. I don't want to give complete control, but what about, what about my job? And what about this? And what about that? Like as if God wants to, is in heaven waiting to, to ruin your life. God doesn't want to ruin your life. He wants to expand your territory. Now, if you're happy where you're at, cool. Just hopefully that's God, what God called for you to do. But that's not new territory. If you're still going to live the same way tomorrow, then that's not new territory. That's just life. Huh? And you might live life like that and, and die, and I guess that's your thing. But there are others. Oh, let me say, there are others that have a sense of a purpose. There are other people that say, there's got to be more to life than just what I'm doing. This is not enough. No matter what you're doing right now, it's not enough. You, you, there's a sense in you that I got to do more. I got to do something. I got to go somewhere. God has put a call on my life. And there's more to life than just going to work and doing it. There's got to be more to life than just living like that. God, is there more to life? I want that. See, that's what burns inside me. I am not satisfied with where I'm at. Oh, I'm content. Thank you, Lord. But my house doesn't give me joy. My car doesn't give me joy. What gives me joy is when I step into new territory, when I see new people, and I begin sharing the gospel, and they open their heart to Jesus Christ, and they say, yes, I'll make him my Lord. I'll make him my master. My friend, that's what turns me on. That's new territory. All this other stuff, come on. Come on, man. If you're honest with yourself, life is boring. Oh, come on. All right, one person said amen. I guess, I guess you guys have an exciting life, but you're evil can evil or something like that, huh? But life, after a while, is like redundant. Write down. I get up in the morning. What time you get up? 11. Well, you done wasted the whole morning. Get up earlier. Right? Some people get up late. Get up earlier, man. There's a lot of hours there you wasted. And if, if, if now... If it's only once or twice, that's cool. We understand that. But if it's every week, every day, you're wasting a lot of hours. Mm-hmm. And then in the middle of the day, what are you doing? Some people are so hooked to, to soap operas. Oh, my soap opera. My no, me novella. I, just, me, I missed it. Well, a lot of hours. I, I'm here to tell you, nobody is too busy. And everybody has time. Everybody. Where do you use your time? Do you use it in the presence of the Lord? Do you use it in studying his word? Do you use it and allow God to begin to refresh you? When you begin to use your time wisely, all of a sudden you realize, you know what, I'm not too busy. I really, I really believe that time is wasted. And listen, time, that is your most valuable commodity. Because you can never get back time once it's spent. Never get it back. And what have I said many times? I have a house, I have a car. If my house were to burn and my car were to be robbed, guess what? I can always recoup that car and get another house. But if I, my time, once it's gone, I can never get it back. Every day I'm getting older and older. And my, me and my wife, I laugh, right? My wife gets up and says, ah, oh, I got this pain here. Oh, I never had it before. Yeah, Honey, dear, we're getting old. We can't do nothing about that. And you old folk like me, you know what I'm talking about. I said, oh, what's that? What's that? Old age. Because just keep going. And we get older and older. 
So redeem the time. Young person, young lady, young man, don't waste your time. Because once it's gone, you can never redeem it. It never comes back. You know what I'm saying? Huh? See, the overflow given to every believer comes in five areas, and I'm going to end with this, I promise. Huh? Every believer is a high priest. 1 Peter 2.9 reads, but you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are a kingdom of priests, God's holy nation, his very own possession. See, sometimes we don't really know who we are. Well, that's what we are, every believer. We're called to be right before God and walk in holiness. Now, listen, it's hard to believe that because as perverted as people are today, it's hard to say you're a holy nation. Right? Because we have issues. Does anybody have, not have issues? We all have issues. And to say, how can I be a holy priest? How can I be a, a holy nation? How can I be a priest? Remember, it's not because of who you are. It's because of who God is. It's not because of what you do. It's, in fact, it's in, despite who you are, God says you are this. Why? Because the, the simple reason, we believe God. Does anybody believe God? That's why Abraham would counted him as righteousness. Why would we be in church trying to figure out who God is? Because we believe that he is the creator of the heavens and earth. We believe he is holy. We believe he has done miracles. We believe he has, he has made things right. We believe that. And because we believe that God says, I'm going to give you, I'm going to count, put that on your account as righteousness. By the simple fact, you believe. Because there are many who don't believe. They don't think Christianity is real. They don't think God is real. And the Bible says, to those who do not believe, it is foolishness to those who do not believe and are perishing and on their way to hell. But because we believe, God said, I'm going to count you as righteous. Because he knows we're all messed up. He knows we have issues. He knows the flesh is, is very strong in many of us. Hello, someone? Right? He knows that. So be careful. But as long as you believe and you keep digging into the word of God, he will make you right. Hmm? Every believer is a high priest. Every believer is also commissioned to make disciples. And that's where people miss it. How many Christians really spend their life trying to make a disciple? See, if we want to step into new territory, right, that's one of the issues that we have to do. We are, we're a holy nation, but we're called to make disciples. When, when Jesus was on the mount getting ready to, to ascend to heaven, he didn't say, go ye ministers and make disciples. No, he was talking to every believer. Go and make disciples. Now, the very fact that we start stepping out and trying to make disciples, now God, God is obligated to begin to give you things that you'd never have before. Why? Because you have said, God, I'm going to listen to your call and I'm going to make disciples. Now, that clicks you into another area. It, it, it turns on another aspect of your walk with God. And God says, okay, I'm going to give you this. I'm going to give you this. Why? Because now you're being obedient to what I've told you to do. See, don't have this misconception that God is going to give you things just because you come to Victor Outreach or any church for that matter. No, my friend. The first step, you got to come in, start tithing. But when you begin to make disciples, all of a sudden you obligate God to click you into another level. Why? Because you're being obedient to him. And then he takes you to what? To new territory. Stay with me. Uh, every believer receives power from the Holy Spirit. Now think about that. Think about this. If every believer, if every believer receives power, do you believe that? Okay. I don't want to offend you. If every believer receives power, and every believer has power, what are we doing with it? What in the heck are you doing with God's power? See, I would, I would say this. Every believer believes they should have it. But every believer doesn't. Because you can't contain power. Power to be power has to be used. Now, otherwise, what I say? It's like having a cell phone. I got a nice cell phone. Where is it at? I love my cell phone. This is the note. Quiero que sepas. And it has this little thing right here in the bottom. Right here. 
You can write on your phone. You can cut out pictures. But I have this phone. But if I'm missing one thing, this phone is no good. If I don't have what? That little chip that goes in there. What do they call that? The what? Like a little card, that little SIM card. Christians are like a phone without a SIM card. They have the power, they have the device, they have the church, they have the Bible, but they forgot one little thing. They don't have that little SIM card. And what good is it without a SIM card? So you got to get your SIM card. Huh? You got to get your SIM card to activate your power. What is that? I'm trying to tell you. Believe that you're a high priest. Begin to make disciples. And then all of a sudden, when you start stepping in, God gives you your SIM card. Boom! And he pops you in. Why? Because now you're doing something with what he has given you already. Hmm? Acts 1 8 said, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and up to the end of the earth. You will receive power, and the evidence that you have his power is you're a witness. Listen, my friend, I'm going to tell you something right now. I'm going to hurt your feelings right now. If you're not a witness, then my friend, you don't have a SIM card. You're just a nice looking phone. Oh, my shoe came in. It's all right. Huh? You got to get your SIM card and start activating. The evidence of power received is being a witness. That word witness is a very interesting word. So my piano comes forward. It is martos. Witness, martos. That's where we get the word martyr. Why? Because to be a witness, you're going to have to die to yourself. Because let's be, the, the first time I shared somebody, didn't you feel stupid? Well, that's just me. Come on, let me say it again. Let's get it wrong. The first, when I first got saved, I go, man, I'm saved. I was in the neighborhood, right? I'm born again. And they said, now you have to be a witness. I go, you mean I got to tell my friends? I have to tell my friends that I'm born again? I have to tell my friends that I love Jesus? Oh, no, that's embarrassing. Is that just me? Come on, man. Okay, thank you. The one was on it. The first time I'm like, wow. See, I had to become a martyr. What do I mean? I had to die to my embarrassment. I had to die to my, to my feeling stupid. Because I really, I did. That's the best way I can say it. I felt dumb. Here I am from the neighborhood. You know, Vato Loco. Este, right? Vato Loco in the neighborhood. And I had to go tell all my homeboys, hey, dude, I'm saved. I remember when Paul tried to go, saved? What the heck is that? I'm born again. Born again? What do you mean born again? We didn't know anything about it. Yeah, I'm born, you know, I accepted Jesus in my heart. Oh, and then uh, what they say? Oh, you became one of those weaklings. Oh, you needed, oh, you needed a crutch. You're one of those now? Oh, no. I had to get past my insecurities, past my reputation, past all those stuff. I said, no, I accepted Christ into my heart. He set me free. He delivered me from drugs and alcohol. He delivered me from perversion. He is the most powerful entity that ever lived or has ever been. He is God, the creator of the heavens and earth. And I have accepted him into my heart. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ can change your life. Jesus Christ can set you free. Jesus Christ is alive and well. And yes, dig this. I fell in love with the man. And I ain't tutti fruity. Well, Bob blew up, ding, 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 right? Huh? But I had to overcome that. Why? Because I had to die. I had to become a martyr, a witness. So we have to be witnesses. So evidence of power is you die to yourself. And listen, every believer, everyone in here has a spiritual gift. I don't know what it is, but you have a gift. Some people have a gift of hospitality. You know those people, you come over to the house, and they just make you feel at home and welcome. You come in there, and they offer you a tortilla right off the grill. You don't die with a little bit of butter. Come on now. That's a gift. And they make you feel wanted. They make you feel good. But everybody has, I don't know what your gift is, but you have to begin to operate in your gift. Because right? you have the gift. And if you don't operate in gift, how do you expect to get into new territory? God wants to take you somewhere new, but you got to begin to stir yourself up. Stir it up. Right? Every believer was, was created for specific good works. Something you're called to do. 
That's why we're a body. I, you're not called to do what I do. I'm not called to do what you do. You're not called to do what your neighbor does, but you have a gift. You have something special that this body needs. You got to begin to use your gift. You got to begin to use your gift. Amen? Yeah. Psalms 90 as I close. 90 verse 13. See, living in the overflow is a result of God's favor in your life, of you operating your gifts. Psalms 30, rather, Psalms 90, verse 13 through 17. Relent, O Lord. How long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days have you afflicted us. For as many years have you seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to your children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. The favor, the splendor, the grace, the beauty, the pleasantness. May that fall upon us. And listen, that's what I've been praying and believing God, that favor would fall upon you. One sister got a job recently. And I want to say her name because I don't want to embarrass her, but I was telling my wife, I've been praying for favor. Why? Because everybody needs a break, right? Everybody needs one little break. And, and, and it's like, how did I get this job? I know another young man got a great job. How did I get this? Because everybody needs a break. But I don't think it's just a break. I am praying that God brings favor. That, that, that you'd come into your next appointment. You'd come into your next interview. And uh, it wouldn't be anything you do. But all of a sudden that person would look at you in a different light. And, and they're going to they're gonna say, I don't know why, but I'm going to hire you. I, I, I could hire all these other people. They got more qualification. But you have, there's something different about you. You know what's different about you? The Holy Spirit is in you. And there's something different about you. You're walking in his word. There's something different about you. You're doing something for God. You're saying, God, I'm going to become faithful to you. And all of a sudden, God begins to share that favor with people. And people begin to look at you differently. So that's favor. So when you get that job, that's God's favor. When you get that promotion, God put favor on your life. Huh, that's why I tell God, guys, hang in there, man. Look for God's blessing. Look for his favor. Or you can do it the way you used to do it. And you're going to back in the joint, locked up, or OD. That's what happens, man. But if you want God's favor, you better do it right. Do it God's way. Do it God's way. I never forget. Young guy. Young guy. All my friends dying, hanging themselves, flipping out on PCP, acid, you name it. Getting shot by the cops, running and gunning. And here I am to God. I don't want to do it that way. I know that way. Is there another way? Pastor Steve, simple message. You don't have to live like that anymore. There is another way. God provi provides another direction. I told the Lord, God, if there's another way, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try your way. That was 35 years ago. I'm going to try your way. And God has been faithful. That's why I love that song we did, that fast, fast song. God has been faithful. God has blessed me. God has prospered me. God has restored my health. He has given me barns that I did not build. He has given me wells that I did not dig. He's faithful. You got to trust him. Guys, you got to trust us. There's a different way. Church, you got to trust. There's a different way. And that's God. I want every head bowed and your right closed. So God will establish our hands, the work of our hands, as it gives us favor. He will appoint you and make you sure. He will prosper you as he gives you his favor. I'm going to pray this prayer. And after I pray this prayer, 
those which I want to walk and step into God's favor, into the overflow of his blessing. I want you to come forward. And here's my prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for making me in your image and giving me a purpose. Forgive me for not giving you all of me and settling for my limited dreams. Allow me to be used by you as I move into your overflow. I want to fulfill your desire for my life. Expand my influence to impact beyond all I can imagine. Let me live in the overflow of your blessing and anointing. I am your servant. Here I am. Lord, send me. If you agree with that prayer, and God is moving in your heart, the altar is open.